Welcome to another edition of RTD Interviews. And today I'm excited to have a returning guest, Mr. Leo Gantz, the creator and founder of the Wealth Research Group. And today he's joining us to share his thoughts on the economy, geopolitical tensions, as well as his forecasts and predictions for 2024. And as always, it's good to have Leo check in with us just to share his thoughts and expertise on what's happening around the world. So Leo, thank you for joining us on RTD Interviews. Pleasure to be here. Well, Leo, as always, man, it's good to have you on and uh, getting a chance to check in with you and see what you're keeping your eye on these days. And so here we are, beginning of February, and of course, lots of things unfolding globally now. But before we dive any further, I'm curious to hear about what you're keeping your eye on. What are some things that you believe the audience uh, should really be paying attention to, especially in the beginning of 2024 and especially moving forward? I think uh, 2024, uh, the most important geopolitical and economic event is China. China right now is in a situation where clearly um, the breakdown of globalization is hurting it terribly. As you know, uh, China uh, became a superpower or, uh, or, or, or the world's second largest economy because of its relationship with the United States that started with inclusion in, in the WTO during the, uh, uh, the early 2000s. And from there on, the, you know, the, the trade-off between Let's integrate China into the global economy and make it uh, and make the dependencies between the United States and China bigger, so that both countries will have less of an incentive to attack each other, uh, i.e., globalization. Um, it, it it started to backfire once um, the aggression from both sides became more apparent, especially from the Chinese side. And w- when it got to the point of tariffs. Uh, during the Trump administration, and then zero COVID, uh, COVID policies, etc. Now it's known that these two are moving apart from each other. Uh, they're trying to reduce the dependencies, and it's much easier for the United States to do so than for China. And there, therefore, um, the aggression will come from um, from China more so than from the United States. And because of that, uh, you've seen. First of all, the real estate bubble in China starting to crumble. You're seeing many companies exiting China, which is why they sent their senior delegates to Davos to persuade Western companies that um, they can do business in China, that there is a rule of law in China, that the regulations won't flip on them, that they won't manipulate currency, but to no avail uh, so far. And so the Chinese government is embarking on unprecedented stimulus packages. But we shall see how they go. So to watch China is to understand where the world is going in 2024. Because if they're successful, then you'll have uh, less tension. They will have less of an incentive to uh, further the chaos in the Middle East uh, and and uh, and at the border between uh, Russia, Ukraine, and NATO countries. But if they fail, then they will probably opt for uh, the, the war option. And that's why I think it's critical to watch what they do. Interesting. Now, if they fail with this monetary experimentation, because I saw that they're doing some packages, as you just mentioned, if they fail and their bubble economy system structure kinds of unravels, you know, so they would choose to initiate more war type of efforts or, or, or in how would that monetary debt stuff influence the rest of the world? Okay. So first of all, let's talk Let's understand China. China is a country that is built on systemic corruption from the top to the individual. The entire economy is built on stuff that in in the West does not exist uh, in in an institutional fashion. In other words, everything in China is inaccurate. The data leading from the municipality to the top. And what's worse is this culture of only telling Xi Jinping what he wants to hear. So he can't even make decisions based on reality because uh, if he doesn't like what he hears, then you see people disappearing, you see people getting fired, you see people um, getting sanctions and, and, and much worse. The problem is the Chinese have created a real estate bubble to where they probably have around two units, in other words, two apartments, for each person in China, 25% of GDP is tied to the real estate sector. And because Chinese people do not trust the stock market, all of their savings are tied to their homes. And if you have a situation where 25% of GDP is real estate, 
uh, for uh, compared to uh, during the height of the subprime bubble, it was 8% of American GDP. So just so you understand the size of this, um, you understand that you have on your hands one of the greatest ever bubbles in human history. And it's not easy to unwind it, even though they have strong banks and, and, and uh, a very healthy banking system in general. Because right now, the demographics of China are collapsing. The birth rate versus the mortality rate is uh, creating a situation where uh, the Chinese population is plummeting and the cohort of uh, demographics that uh, help it the most, those that buy homes, those that are productive in terms of their job growth, uh, the, the 25 to 50 year olds, they're, they're small and they're not having any children or they're having very few children. So by the time this century, uh, this century ends, in other words, by the time we get to 2100, the United States will probably have the same amount of people as China. And we've never seen a country go from 1.3 or 1.2 billion to about half a billion. We've never seen what happens to a country that goes through such a huge demographic decline. The government is doing everything it can to um, stimulate mother or, or would-be mothers to have more children. But after 336 million abortions during the one-child policy and all of that indoctrination, and after this massive urbanization that took uh, you know, the paddy rice farmers into the big cities where kids, you know, they're, they're a liability until they're 18. Uh, Chinese women just do not care to have more than one child and, and a pet, a dog or, 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 or a cat or something. And so you are entering a period where during this age of deglobalization, China's economy is going to deteriorate at the fastest clip that you've ever seen. And you can't trust the data. You cannot trust the data. The only way that they can save themselves is by uh, succumbing to uh, to the demands of America and, and the West. And I just don't see that happening. So we will either have a huge revolution in China and they'll have a completely new regime that uh, basically the, the CCP will go down or the CCP will remain in control, be way more violent, way more vicious, way more authoritarian and um and everyone will suffer both uh to me seem inevitable so it, it, we are reaching some sort of a a point with china where they have to uh, and the chinese people where they have to take uh drastic measures and because of that i think that in, in the next three four years you will see if they get more aggressive and go for desperate measures which is what i'm talking about or will they choose the, the, the path that uh, previous uh, CCP leaders before Xi Jinping have chosen? And that is that if you're weak, it's fine. As long as you're playing the long game, just succumb to what the United States is asking you to do and uh, build strength and come back to, uh, you know, to, to, to the table later when you're stronger. So we shall see what they do. That's why I'm saying keep an eye on China. Whatever happens in China will dictate the rest of 2024 for everybody else. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. Now, I'm curious to mention, you mentioned Chinese banks being relatively strong, and I saw not long ago that I think uh, the monetary regulators lowered uh, capital requirements there, trying to stimulate more uh, borrowing and things of that nature. But let's talk about the commercial banks, uh, I'm sorry, the regional <laughs> banks here in the U.S. especially with this commercial real estate. Uh, it looks like crises unfolding. So we had New York, um, Community Bank Corp just last week, I think. And then, of course, last year, SVB and all the dominoes that fall from there due to, I guess, the debt load that they're carrying and higher interest rate environments causing, you know, problems with, you know, being able to support that debt. So how how will this play out? And, of course, what can people look forward to uh, as far as overall health of the banks, given the current environment we're in now and factor in this, you know, a potential pivot that's coming anytime now? Or what are your thoughts on that? Um I, I don't. I don't think it's a. It's it's a big deal. There's over four thousand regional banks. There obviously are some mismanaged ones uh, that didn't foresee the greatest uh, rate hike cycle uh, since uh, Paul Volcker, and and they'll they may go under. They may merge with other banks that have a better balance sheet. But uh, overall, uh, don't you know? Don't pay too much uh, attention to it. It's, it will blow over. 
Fair enough. Fair enough. I like that. Now let's get into some other geopolitical tension side of things. Um, so you're currently in Israel and you guys are in the midst of, you know, some military conflicts there. So I'm curious, you know, being there pre presently now, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? What concerns you about that? And is, is the movement progressing in a way that, you know, Israel's seeking out to accomplish what they're trying to do? Give us some details on that. Um, this, th this area of land uh, is one of the most documented uh, pieces of land in the world. Um, before uh, the, the country of Israel was formed in 1948, uh, the British had a mandate over this area uh, between 1922 and, and 1948. During that time, uh, there were uh, uh, living here, there were Arabs and Jews and Christians. Uh, the, uh, before the British, the Ottoman Empire uh, had conquered this area from the Crusaders and uh, Arab people and Jewish people and, and Christian people lived under as, as you know, servants of the uh, Ottoman Empire. Um, none of these people have ever uh, considered themselves as quote unquote Palestinians. The, the, this area was named Palestine um, for a period of time after the Romans conquered it and wanted to change its name from Judea uh, to Palestine. And so the, the, the word Palestine comes from uh, the Romans that did that, but as a, na as, as a people, as a culture, as a folklore, as tradition, as a body of people that pursue something, there is no Palestinian people. Uh, it, 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 the pre-1948 Arabs and Muslims that lived here in Israel, uh, what today is Israel, uh, came here either for jobs during the British mandate or uh, because they were uh, uh, some sort of a nomadic people during the Ottoman Empire. Um, the perpetual delusion of uh, the Palestinian uh, train of thought is that somehow uh, this will all go back to pre-1948 uh, before they uh, started a war after they uh, rejected the UN resolution for two states, an Arab country and, uh, and a Jewish country, uh, and, and that they will get their, um, uh, whichever piece of land their grandfather had 80 years ago. Uh, there is no other group of refugees in the world where you grandfather or inherit the refugee status. The point of being a refugee is that uh, you try to resettle it. Every refugee organization, uh, in the world resettles the refugees. Only the one that is in Gaza uh, in, where you inherit it. So right now, the 2.3 million people that live in Gaza, uh, there are about 20,000 of them. So that is less than 1% that are dating back to the pre-1948 uh, era. The rest of them uh, are, are not refugees. They're the, either the sons or the grandsons of refugees. And this whole notion uh, has perpetuated this illusion, this dream that somehow it will go back uh, uh, to pre-1948. The problem is uh, that the theological um, uh, regimes that ruled the Gaza people, be it Hamas or before, they have no compromise uh, or pragmatic like the West wants them to be. So the West comes to them with, hey, how about you get this? How about this? How about 60, the 67 uh, truth lines? How about uh, the 1948 lines? They don't want any of it. They don't want a country. They want no Israel. And to go back to uh, whatever, the Ottoman Empire days or, or Islamic State days or, or anything else. So because that uh, delusion has been perpetuated by funding from the UN and other, and other uh, organizations, they have felt the, uh, they haven't felt the pain of their delusion. After October seventh, the the entire uh, uh, political sphere in the Middle East has changed, because now the United States, the EU, the UN, they all see that no matter what they offer these people and how much they fund them with billions of billions of dollars, it all went to terror, and it all went to perpetuate that delusion. And so the the this area is moving towards a different, a whole together different um, reality where uh, a new solution will be proposed. And I don't think that uh, this delusion will be perpetuated uh, any longer. Uh, uh, the Western nations have realized what happened to all the billions that they have invested in trying to create a two-state solution. Um, and, and so what I think 
uh, you're seeing is part of this deglobalization um, uh, period playing out here in the Middle East, where uh, Israel and and its allies, part of them, the ones that the uh, uh, Jared Kushner under the Trump administration uh, brought together under the Abraham Accords, and part. Uh, or, or, uh, and the most important part is Saudi Arabia that's supposed to come in uh, during the Biden administration and, and the economic framework that was trying to normalize relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia in order to advance the entire Middle East forward uh, was taken uh, has taken two steps back because of uh, the Iranian agenda. And I think that uh, what, what you're seeing and what you will see in the next year or two is the struggle between Iran trying to perpetuate their imperial agendas, which are based on, I don't know, 18th century, 19th century mentality, and the wave of the future, which are the Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Israel, of course, the United States, we're trying to bring the Middle East forward into the 21st century with technology, with um, innovation, with integration, with more commerce, with, with progress. Uh, and, and so we will see who wins uh, this. But uh, in my opinion, um, the liberal progressive agenda, which uh, is, is to try to buy friends. That's all it is. You're trying to buy friends um, who don't want to be your friend. They, they just, they don't care to go to coffee shops. They don't want to have a Frappuccino. They don't want your Western way of life. They want something else. And so when you, when you bribe them and continue to fund them, all you do is perpetuate their delusion. Um, it's almost like a like a tree, and all you do is continue to fertilize that tree, and somebody else chops off the branches, and the branches grow back because you put more more uh, more water and fertilize it. If you want a permanent solution, you need to chop the whole tree, burn the forest, and build a city over it. That's the only way to get this done. And and the, uh, the United States failed at doing this strategy in Iraq and in Afghanistan. And, and so the question becomes now, is the United States ready to do what President Truman did when he faced off with Japan um, or when uh, the Allies faced Germany? Are you going to root out the entire way of thinking for a culture or are you going to try more of the same, which is trying to reason with them? Uh, and so we're, we're, we're reaching that point. And that point is going to be the most volatile point um, because what you're saying basically is the end of Bretton Woods. When you have uh, groups like the Houthis in Yemen threatening maritime shipping, what they are saying to you is the Bretton Woods system, which is that the United States Navy will patrol the open oceans so that global trade can go uninterrupted is over as far as we're concerned. And as they do that, um, they are they are forcing other nations to militarize and to protect their uh, their interests, and so uh, this entire region, and not only this region, but the Taiwan uh, China area, the Russia Ukraine NATO area, um, and to a degree, many of the African nations are facing the same thing. That they will now need to choose whether they go with the axis of China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and Venezuela or are they going with NATO, the United States, and other uh, Western countries like Japan and Australia? And, and in the middle of all the salad is a new block called the Global South, led by India and other huge demographic but poor nations, such as Brazil. So it, it, it's a very interesting mix, and we've never seen anything uh, similar to it because um, – We've never tr we've never seen um, a very strong uh, block led by poor countries with huge demographics. So I think we're entering a very interesting period. Could be very violent, um, and 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 the stakes are incredibly high. Um, and, and and what's interesting here, the most interesting thing to me, is that Americans are about to see whether or not they actually like the results of. Isol uh, isolation, because there's a huge group of uh, Americans, particularly re Republicans, that believe that America should not intervene in world events. They 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 go after the doctrine, the the, Mon the Monroe uh, doctrine, which is, hey, protect, let's protect our borders. We have two oceans on each side. We have Canada and Mexico. Let's let the other countries figure it out on their own. 
we don't need to take a, a stake in these other conflicts. Let's just uh, isolate ourselves and take care of ourselves. And soon uh, we will start to see whether or not they actually like uh, the results of that idea. Because uh, even though it sounds, you know, sounds uh, euphoric and, and yeah. very uh, utopian, what it actually means is that you don't have influence over anything else. And so if the uh, Russians decide that they want to build a base in Nicaragua or in Colombia and put nuclear weapons directly threatening the United States, like the, uh, they did in the days of Cuba, then the, doc the Monroe Doctrine says, you know, uh, leave that alone. We need to just protect our borders. Um, if the Chinese decide that they want to take over a few islands in the Pacific and uh, station nuclear subs over there, you're going to start to see. What Americans uh, sometimes fail to understand is what imminent threat means, what, what, what direct threat over the United States means. Because there is none, they believe that this will always be the case. And as long as America stays out of everything, then no, no war will be instigated. They have this notion that only America starts wars. And so we will start to see if they like uh, the idea once it's implemented. Uh, in my opinion, they will realize that, it, that if, if let alone, most countries throughout history choose to either conquer or to expand or to, to uh, uh, expand their circle of influence, there is no vacuum. Where America leaves, China and Russia will come in. Right, right. Good point there. And so just, you know, to that point there as an American, like at this current moment, you know, all I've known is U.S. intervention in Middle Eastern affairs. Whether I believe in the cause or not is irrelevant. I just know that there is much greater forces behind um, uh, the, the or the, we call it the powers that be. They love to have their tentacles spread out on a variety of sectors for multiple reasons. And unfortunately, nothing really positive comes from it. So the chance of U.S. coming back home and minding our own business is not possible because just we're just too deep in this uh in this game so far. So I just, you know, whether we stay or come back home and protect our own borders, it's, you know, Americans here have a lot more things on, on their mind as far as this uh, migration crisis at the border and civil unrest potentially amongst all this political chaos we're experiencing. So, yeah, we got our, our hands filled here. So I, I do believe that uh, times are changing and, you know, this upcoming year will be crucial for all of us. So, um, but lastly, I want to get your thoughts on uh, the central banking aspect. Jerome Powell gave an interesting speech on 60 Minutes a couple of days or what, two days ago, mm -hmm. basically st stating the fiscal pathway is unsustainable and that between now yes. and sometime soon, uh, the, the U.S. need to get their, 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 their ship in order. But then again, not sure how, how that can be done, given $34 trillion and Fed's balance sheet of close to $8 trillion and probably going to be climbing sooner than later. So what are you thinking about this Fed pivot? And you know, will this Fed pivot buy more time or uh, is it inevitable some type of Correction, crash landing, soft landing, hard landing, you know, un unavoidable at this current point. I think what's most likely going to happen is you will see um, Powell making not a drastic mistake, but certainly uh, uh, a mis uh, an error in, in how he manages the rate cuts to where inflation will probably, at least for the next five, six, seven years, will not go down to the 2% target. And so you will stay in an economy with about 2.8 uh, to 3.2 percent inflation. The new norm would be around 3 percent. Just like in the previous decade, when they when they targeted 2 percent, it was normally between 1.2 and 1.6. So it, it, the norm was about 1.4. I think that that's what you're going to see, and it changes a lot of things. When you have 3% inflation or 2.8% inflation instead of 1.4, it, it remarkably changes the risk profile of many assets. And I think that that's where we're going um, with inflation. Uh, they will start cutting in May. Um, in other words, the, the, the March uh, meeting will probably be, um, uh, will be a, a preparation on how they plan to, to cut rates, uh, what are they thinking, how are they thinking about cutting rates, the whole thing? And then in May, they will start the cut. Um, and, and, and to me, I think the cuts will be very gradual. Um, you will not see uh, inter the Fed funds rate below four in 2024. And so with that environment in mind, I think that uh, the indices will not perform well.
because the indices, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, are very weighted on the Magnificent Seven, the, the seven biggest companies in the world. And I think the era of them dominating um, and, and expanding um, is going to flatten out. And the other 493 companies um, will will outperform them. But because of the sheer size uh, of the uh, Magnificent Seven over the indices, the indices will probably be flat or flattish for a couple of years, for uh, you know a year or two or three. Um, that that to me um, really builds the case for commodities to serve as a hedge for that portfolio, and that's why I think that commodities will do much better than um, uh, than stocks in the coming years. Mm, interesting, interesting. Now I'm also curious to get your thoughts on. Uh, what has been labeled as a new asset class with the uh, Bitcoin ETF uh, being launched at the beginning of this year here and all the euphoria between BlackRock, Fidelity and all the you know major uh, institutions uh, looking to you know add that to their portfolios. And so it, does that change the game, you think, for the digital asset space, making it legit somewhat by this ETF coming about and there being potential for uh, institutions to bring in pension funds and things of that nature? And, you know, will there be opportunity, you think, in the crypto space or, or what are you thinking? I don't know. I I uh, I'm not uh, I'm not expert on this matter. Mm -hmm. um, to me, you know, after 14 years, there really isn't um, a big use case for Bitcoin yet. Um, and so I'm, I'm I don't know. It's it's such an enigma to me as to where is where is the this economy going? What countries are going to use uh, a digital currency like Bitcoin or others? Where is this entire uh, sphere uh, um, leading the world to, towards? Right now, the, the Bitcoin trading um, or, or uh, Bitcoin in general and, and the, the other more robust um, uh, cryptocurrencies, they serve... Uh, use cases that, that are not productive for, for, for the economy. They're, they're productive in, in very uh, niche capacities. Chinese billionaires that want to get their money out of China. Um, uh, mo most of the use cases are not part of the way forward for digital currency. So I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I don't know um, to tell you if it's going to be a big deal or not to make it institutional or actually if it's going to be a huge deterrence. Um, so it's it, it to me, it remains uh, an open question. All right. That's understandable there. And so once again, once again, it's one of the things where we have to wait and see, but uh, there's a lot of people excited about it. And so uh, I personally have mixed feelings towards it just because I thought the whole point was to be disruptive and to be against the exactly. current financial status, uh, current financial system. But the fact that they're merging lets me know who's probably influencing that. So once again, it may not end up well for the average investor in that space. So. But you mentioned commodities being very favorable um, moving forward, given the current circumstances. And so, you know, gold and silver, as well as I'm assuming that some of the miners as well will be benefiting from uh, the, the probably the newfound demand for gold and silver and uh, other uh, metals of that nature. You thinking? Um, so gold is trading right now um, in a very unique pattern because. Uh, it, it's trading at an all-time high in about 80 different fiat currencies. It's within less of a percent from its all-time high in USD terms. Mm -hmm. um, but the excitement is not, it's just not there. The futures don't indicate any excitement. The GLD shares are standing are, are plummeting, um, which means that something huge is about to happen to gold. There's just, there's no um it's at a crossroads it has already tried to breach this resistance for the fourth time at 2070 and so if it does after 11 years we may uh be be breaking out of a massive uh bottom that was formed uh during the 2011 to 2024 era and if that's happening i think gold's next big move takes us to about 26 2700 um in that world, silver starts to outperform uh, gold, actually moves faster. I think it, it moves to 50 fairly quickly from here, let's say two to three years. In, in the world that silver outperformed gold, the miners outperform silver. 
And so if, if that is the path that we are going, and the first leg will be gold going over 2100, then yeah, I'm, I'm supremely bullish on the binders. Let me, let me put it this way. If gold goes over 2100 and silver goes over 30, the best way to play this is to go as leverage as you can on, uh, on the miners. Because that's where you're going to see moves that are absolutely uh, near parabolic. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, great insight there. So once again, it just gives people something to uh, further dissect and study. And uh, if they feel the need to uh, take that level of risk, then it could be a great opportunity at the end of the day. So uh, but Leo Gantz, as always, man, it's good to have you on the show to uh, just you know pick your brain, see what you're thinking about, what you're keeping an eye on, as well as giving the uh, audience a chance to see what is uh, what could potentially lies ahead. So uh, wealthresearchgroup.com is where people can find out more, as well as download some reports and whatnot. And so it's always looking forward to connecting with you the next couple of months. We'll see where we're at and see what uh, the world is looking like at that point. But once again, thank you for joining me on RTD Interviews, my friend. Thank you for having me.